say thank you to Carol and just add my voice to her words of welcome to you all this morning as we come to worship and to give thanks to the Lord our God. I'd like to commence by reading for you from Psalm 8. And we read these words. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies, or you cause your enemies to be silent and the foe and the avenger. When I consider the heavens and the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands and you put everything under his feet. All the flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swims in the path of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And they, we thank the Lord for that word of his. And we turn to song. And we sing our opening piece. It's from the Mission Parades. It's 133. And you'll find on this Father's Day that there's mention of Father in most of these. Father, I place into your hands the things that I can't do. Father, I place into your hands the things I cannot do. Father, I place into your hands the things that I've been through. Father, I place into your hands the way that I should go. For I know I always can trust you. And as you take your seats, we will come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we come. We come before your throne of grace. We come acknowledging, as the psalmist said, that you are the creator of heaven and earth, the works of your fingertips. And Lord, as we look at the beauty and the splendor of creation on a bright sunlit morning, we are amazed that the magnitude of your glory and splendor, for it was at the spoken word that you created all that we see in nature. You created the heavens and the earth. 
And Father, you place man in the position of stewardship to care for your creation. And we wonder, Lord, how you entrusted such a beautiful thing to us. Because, Father, we've got to acknowledge that we have let you down so many times we have failed you. We abuse your creation. We abuse one another. And, Father, we don't show the love that you show to us. So we come before your throne acknowledging that we are a people who have done wrong. We are a people who have sinned and are in need of forgiveness because your word tells us that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. So we come, Lord, seeking your mercy, your grace, your compassion, your forgiveness. And we come seeking that, Lord, not because we think we deserve it or we've earned it, but because your son died upon a cross that we might be forgiven. Your son who was without sin gave his life that we might be forgiven. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask for forgiveness. And then we ask for more because we ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. You promised that when your son returned to heaven that he would send another counselor, another comforter to be with us. And you poured out the Holy Spirit. So now we ask, Lord, by the moving of your spirit in our midst, grant us the ability to worship you. Yes, but more. For we ask for an assurance of sins forgiven. We ask, Lord, for an assurance of that reconciliation and the equipping that we need to serve you, to honor you, to worship you. So move by your spirit in our midst, Lord, and let us know your presence here today. And we would also want to say thank you, Father, for the offering that has been made. And we trust and pray that you will guide us in how we use it to your honor and your glory. These things we ask, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'd like to um, focus today on that thing of Father's Day. You had noticed that this is Father's Day, hadn't you? I'm sure you've been reminded of it if you've watched TV and all the adverts and all. But when I thought about reflecting on Father's Day today, I began to think about when did it start? What's the origins of Father's Day? And so I turned to that font of all knowledge, Google. And no matter which area I tried to look in, they all seem to go back to the one location, a place in Washington State in America. It had to be America, didn't it? Uh, I'll spell this out for you because I might not pronounce it correctly. S-P-O-K-A-N-E, uh, Spokane, Spoken. Uh, that was where it started. And let me explain to you how it started. 1910, I don't think there were too many of us about in 1910, sure there weren't, no, 1910. And it started with one lady. Her name was Sonora Smart Dodd. That was her name. And she had been born in Arkansas, but she had a desire within her to mark Father's Day. You see, her father, who had been a Civil War veteran, 
had been left with six children. His name was William Jackson Smart, and he raised those six children on his own. And at that time, Mother's Day had been established, and Sonora thought, well, there's a day to mark motherhood, but what about the fatherhood? What about the fathers and those father figures in the community? Surely they need a day uh, to mark what they do. So she approached the local minister's associate, no, the minister's alliance it was, and she asked them about the possibility of holding a service to mark fatherhood and Father's Day. And she wanted it initially on the 5th of June, but I don't know when she approached the ministers, but they came back to her and said they would never have sermons ready in that length of time. So they delayed it and they had it on the 19th of June. This is the 20th of June, isn't it? So third Sunday in, in June, that's when it started. But do you know, they held it in the YMCA and it didn't go down too well. It wasn't well supported wasn't really thought of um, as being very good or anything, not unlike Mother's Day. So it didn't really take off, but they persevered for a year or two. And then Sonora, um, she was involved in doing some studies, so she wasn't there to drive it. So the thing almost fell apart. But then a few years later, when she had finished her studies, she started again. Only this time, she had a little bit of help. She went to a couple of trade associations and asked if they would help her to promote it. I wonder, can you imagine what sort of trade associations she got her to help with Father's Day? The manufacturers of ties, tobacco products, and pipes. So they came on board with her and they helped. And initially it was seen as a cynical marketing ploy just to ride on the back of Mother's Day and so on. So it didn't take off too well, but they persevered, and now you have Father's Day in 2021. And it's a big deal. You get the cards and all the rest of it. And I didn't get any breakfast in bed, by the way. So <laughs> I don't know what that says, but I didn't get any breakfast in bed. But So it has taken off. And fathers, yes, and father figures, they're very important. Not just the fathers, the grandfathers, and no great-grandfathers here today, no? No? No, so, okay. So, Father's Day is important, and I would like to have a look at a passage of Scripture this morning, and it speaks about a relationship between a father and his two sons, and I'm sure you know the passage uh, fairly well. But it's a parable told by Jesus. And uh, you all know what the parable is, don't you? You know that old definition of the parable? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So let's see if we can hear it and then draw out of it a few things to help us uh, understand where we are from the parable. It's taken from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 15. And immediately before this, Jesus has told two other parables. You see, there were some tax collectors and sinners who were there, and they were muttering because he was welcoming sinners and eating with them. And then Je Jesus turned around and he told a parable about a lost sheep. You're familiar with that one, aren't you? Yeah. And then there was the parable of the lost coin. And then he told this parable, and I'll read it for you. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property among them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, 
he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine who was dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and the dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What was going on? Your brother has come, he said, and your father killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed an order, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours who was dead and is alive again, who was lost and is found. And we end there and thank the Lord for that reading from his word. And we're going to sing again. And this time we're singing Abba Father. It's three in the mission prayers, Abba Father, and we'll sing it through twice. Oh, 
well-known passage of Scripture. I'd like to look at it uh, from the standpoint of the relationships that existed between the father and his sons, and indeed potentially existed between the two brothers as well. So let's begin with those brothers. If there were just two sons, and that appears to be the story here, there was a man who had two sons. Now, according to the law of Moses, the firstborn, always firstborn male, sorry, I have to get that bit right, the firstborn male was always to receive a double portion. And if you want to check that up, you can go to Deuteronomy 21, 13 to 17, you'll find it there. So when the younger son was asking for his share of the father's estate, he knew he wouldn't be getting a 50-50 split, but he would actually be getting one third of the father's estate, which then means that the older brother would have been receiving two-thirds. Now, we don't have any for recorded for us here that the older brother objected to the younger brothers asking for the estate to be split between them. Like, would you? He's going to do the dirty work and you're going to get the benefit of it. So that's where we are. So younger son goes and asks for the estate and older brother doesn't object. He goes along with it. Now, by asking for his share of the estate from his father, it could be read that this younger son was actually saying to his father, you know, I can't wait for you to die because I want to get my hands on your money now. So is there any chance you give them to me now? If a parent said, or if a child said that to you, how would you react and how would you feel? Feel rather hurt? Insulted? Unloved? But this father, showing to me immense love, actually divides his estate between the two sons at that stage. I wonder how he divided it up. The young son was intent on leaving, so did he divide it one-third land and money, two-thirds land and money, or did he give all the land to the oldest son and a third of the estate, the value of the estate in monetary terms to the younger son? Because it tells us in a few days he had all his money, all his wealthy possession, everything that was portable, so that he could leave for the far distant land. Father may have been hurt, but he let his son go. I wonder how the older brother felt about his younger brother heading off. We know that when he returned, the older brother appears to have been a little resentful of him coming back. And also we know that while he stayed with his father in his father's house and worked, he almost seems to have done it grudgingly rather than willingly. Because when the father spoke to him after his brother's return, look at how he says that he spent his time. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Oh, that doesn't sound as if it's coming from a heart that was doing it willingly. I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed one of your orders. So he's not living out of a love. He's living out of a sense of duty. So maybe was he a little bit envious of his young brother heading off to explore what life held for him. Was there a jealousy even there between them? But what about the father? His young son wanted to get out from under his father's control, 
wanted to be away to do his own thing. Yet the father recognized that he couldn't try to hold on to his son against his will. Tell me how many of you, when you were younger, really wanted to be out of the control of your parents and doing your own thing, stepping out and going your own way. If that's a feeling you, you've experienced during the club, I think we've all been there wanting to do our own thing, get out from under that control. But now maybe a little bit older, from the parents' point of view, when the children start to come to you and say that they're moving out or they're thinking of heading away or a girlfriend or a boyfriend arrives on the scene and they begin to talk about getting married and things like that, how do you feel? They no, long, no longer need me. And sometimes if they're heading off somewhere and you don't necessarily agree with what they're doing or where they're going or how, what they're proposing to do, you might warn them. You might try to talk to them. But the one thing you know is if you try to prevent them, you'll only drive them away from you. As parents, not just fathers and grandfathers, we've seen it. And as father figures, we've seen it too. And as mothers, you've seen that, where they want to go their own way. And you maybe don't agree with them. But do you stop loving them? I have a picture of this father who day after day after he has watched his young son disappear down the road, maybe walking fairly quickly, with a life before him, without even looking back. I picture the father day after day, maybe standing at the end of that road, looking down it and thinking, will I ever see him again? He hasn't forgotten about him. He hasn't stopped caring for him. He hasn't stopped loving him. Just the way I would suggest that the parents here, when your children are up and away, you haven't stopped caring about them or loving them. You still care for them. They're still in your thoughts and in your heart. But this father longed for his son to return. And then one day, as he was having a look down the road, what happened? He saw that figure. And he recognized it, didn't he? And many of you are maybe thinking, wish my son, my daughter, would give me a call, send me a text, or just call in to see me. They'll hardly send you a letter. Might send you a card. But he saw his son. And he did something that was totally countercultural for that time and place. The father ran to his son. He actually ran to him. Normally in that culture, a father stayed and the sons came. But here we're told that the father ran. Some commentators have suggested that the father ran because there would have been others in the community who would actually have sought to harm his son because of the way he had insulted his father, the way he had taken his father's possessions and squandered them. But the father ran. He embraced him. Yes, the son had his speech already and prepared. Father, I acknowledge that I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. But what did the father do? Oh, the arms were around him. He was kissing him, calling the servants. Bring the best robe. Get a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. And then go and kill that fatted calf because we're going to celebrate. This son who I thought was dead is alive. Who was lost is found. He's back. And I'm so delighted. I'm so pleased. Let's rejoice. 
And so the party begins. Can you picture the celebration? The father and the son, younger son sitting there. Maybe the father with the arm round him. And son, it's great to have you home. It's great to have you back here. But then one of the servants comes in and taps the father on the shoulder and said, uh, your older son's outside. He won't come in. And the father again does something that fathers would not have done. He gets up and he goes to the son. He goes to the oldest son. And he pleads with him. The father pleading with him. Come in. Join the celebration. Your son, your brother has come home. And that's when the older brother shows his true colors. But he answered his father. And you can almost hear the anger and the resentment in these words. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeying your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. I think there was a little bit of resentment and hurt feelings and so on all going there and disrespect for the father. He did not want to celebrate the fact that his young brother had come home. And yet, look how lovingly and how caringly the father responds to that tirade that came at him. My son, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. Remember the father had divided the estate between them. Everything was his. If he'd have wanted to take a young goat and celebrate with his friends, all he had to do was take it because it was his. But son, I had to celebrate because your brother is home. The one that was dead is alive. The one that was lost is found. I had to celebrate that. I said to you at the beginning that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So what can we draw out of that to apply to our lives today? The father, it goes without saying, the image there, as Jesus was telling this, the father in the story represents God, our heavenly father. Loved his sons, loved both of them. Yes, the young one hurt him and walked away. But when he came back, he welcomed him. Bring that into today. How many people are turning their back on God and walking away from him? How many people are rejecting him? But if they come to their senses, as it says here about this young man did, when they come to their senses and turn back to God, do they find God turning his back on them and saying no? No. You find God welcomes them with open arms. And it tells us in Luke chapter 10, or sorry, Luke 15, verse 10, about how there will be rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over every sinner who repents. The Heavenly Father is willing to welcome back those who have strayed, those who have sinned. He's willing to welcome them in. Those who stray away, those who wander away, can be seen as a younger brother. Then who's the older brother? Can the older brother in the story be seen to be 
those who have been faithful to God, have served him well over the years. But when they see someone who returns or comes to faith and is welcomed in and there's a bit of a fuss made of them, do they then become a little bit resentful and say, nobody ever thanks me for anything. Nobody ever really welcomes me. Nobody shows me the love that they're showing him. Why such rejoicing? But I don't get that. Is that the attitude that potentially we could have towards people who come to faith? We could always be resentful of the attention and the love they receive. Let's not be like the older brother. When someone returns to faith, when someone comes to faith, let's join the celebration that begins with the angels of God and his presence. Let us celebrate on this Father's Day. Let us know that we have a heavenly Father who loves us and cares for us and wants us to be in a relationship with him. He longs for us to come home, to be alive, to be found. Are you willing to be found and to receive the love of God the Father? Let us pray. Father, we thank you that when we turn to you, you are a faithful and true God and you are willing to welcome home the repentant sinner. So, Father, let us know your presence, let us know your love, and assist us in serving you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to turn to prayers of intercession. For those of you who get the weekly emails, you'll know that over the past period of time, you've been sent, uh, we've been sending out what is called the prayer of solidarity as well. It comes from the World Development and Relief um, body within our church. And they usually pick out different topics every week. So this week, they've been uh, praying for refugees. Uh, 20th, or sorry, the 14th to the 20th has marked Refugee Week. And as you read through that information, you find there that there are 79 and a half million refugees in the world. 79 and a half million people who have been displaced. So that's where we start our prayers today. For those who have been displaced. So let us pray. God, creator of all, for people who are displaced, may they find a safe refuge. For people who have lost control of their lives, may they know your sure foundation. For people who live in fear, may they be given a strong fortress. For people who are disillusioned, may they have hope in a future. Loving Father, in times of crisis, sorrow and uncertainty, we ask that you draw near. Loving and tender God, we pray for the Rohingya people living in the camps of Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, and particularly those affected by the recent fire in the camp. This day, we hold before you all those who were found longing for a place to call home. We pray for a place uh, to, in a homeland of refugees fleeing conflict that all involved might find boldness and humility to build societies where all feel safe. At this time, we remember Christ, the bringer of peace. Come shine your light upon the refugee and those suffering this day. Bring your peace, healing, and above all, a sense of belonging to all. 
And Father, as we pray this for those who have been displaced, we turn to praying for our own land. And we pray once more for our political leaders at Stormont, where there is the potential for yet another crisis, yet more negotiations to take place between the parties. So we ask, Father, that you will grant guidance and wisdom. You will grant open ears and hearts and minds to hear your guiding and leading, that our political leaders from across the spectrum may work together for the benefit of all people in our community. And we remember once more our health service. We think especially of those who are advising our political leaders on the current state with the virus, the pandemic, so that they will give wise counsel and that the politicians may make the right decisions for all of us. And Father, we thank you for our medical staff, whether it's in hospitals, in GPs practices, or working in the community, on track and trace, on mobile vaccination units, all of that work that is ongoing and in care homes, Lord. We pray for your leading, your surrounding love and protection for them. And turning to the general community, we pray, Lord, for those known to us who need your touch upon their lives, for a physical healing of body, for peace in heart and mind, and for renewal of spirit. And Father, for our Methodist Church in Ireland, we pray for the Reverend Dr. Sari Ambassu as he takes up his role as president for the incoming year. And we ask that you will grant Sar the strength and the wisdom that he requires to carry out his duties. And for Hazel Loney, our lay leader, as she continues into her second year, Father, be with them both. And following our recent conference and the election of a president-designate for next year, the Reverend David Nixon, and for the appointment of a new designated lay leader, Tom Wilson, we pray, Lord, that you will be with them and lead and guide as they give a lead to our church this year and in the years beyond. And at a local level here, Father, we just pray for the local leadership. We pray for strength, for wisdom, for guidance, for direction, that they may be good stewards of all that you have given them and that they may care for those who are in their charge. And Father, we would take time to pray for one another, those with whom we worship on a regular basis, those who sit around us, before us, behind us, to our left, to our right, and those who are absent for various reasons. Just take a moment in stillness to bring them before the throne of grace. In the stillness, Lord, we have uttered cries from our hearts. We thank you that you hear them. Grant us the ability to understand your responses to the prayers we've offered. And may all be to your honour and glory. For we ask all our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. And we're going to sing again. And our closing piece again is from the Mission Praise. It's 456. 456. Make me a channel of your peace. For there is hatred. Let me bring your love. Thank you. 
bless one another with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.